Okay, labor analgesia for the obese parturient. These are your learning objectives. They should be listed in your syllabus. I'm going to discuss the prevalence of the problem, the physiologic effects, and then look at some obstetric and fetal and neonatal outcomes. And lastly, try and tie it all together to the anesthetic implications. Um, this is a map. Uh, each color represents the percentage of people in that state who meet the definition of obese. You'll notice none of the states are blue. They're all yellow and above, meaning at least 20% of um, the people in those states are obese. Overall, about a third of the U.S. population is overweight, a third is obese, and 6% is extremely obese, which is a BMI of greater than or equal to 40, according to this definition. Now, the definition of obesity has never really been defined in pregnancy, but what we do know is that it's more common in women, especially in uh, non-Hispanic black women and in Mexican-American women. So you are going to see this more commonly um, in, if you deal with parturients. I want to go through all the physiologic changes. The thing to keep in mind is that all the physiologic changes of pregnancy that you're used to dealing with, um, the physiologic changes that occur in obesity occur in the same direction. And so they're additive or even more, and so all of the changes get exaggerated in the obese parturient. We'll start with the airway. We know that pregnancy increases the rate of difficult and possibly failed intubation. Obesity also increases that risk, and that's been demonstrated in obstetric patients. The problem is that obesity has a low predictive value by itself, as does Malin potty score and all the other things that we look at. The factor that most uh, has the highest predictive value is a short, large circumference neck, but even that by itself has a very low positive predictive value. So I think the take home message is that if you have an obese pregnant woman, you just have to be very careful because we can't identify who's going to be, told, uh, who's going to be uh, necessarily difficult. Um, regarding the pulmonary system, obesity is associated with increases in oxygen consumption, CO2 production, and work of breathing and decrease lung volumes. You'll notice that these are all the same changes that just occur during pregnancy. So in an obese patient who's pregnant, it can be so exaggerated that the FRC might be so low that it uh, closing volume might exceed FRC, meaning there might be closure of small airways and, relative, and shunting and relative hypoxemia just at rest in an obese parturient. And of course, the combination of a higher oxygen consumption and a lower FRC means that patients are going to desaturate after a period of apnea much more quickly. On the x-axis, um, you see time to desaturation, and you'll notice you know, the patient there with the BMI close to 60 desaturated within less than a minute. Regarding uh, the cardiovascular system, obesity is associated with increases in plasma volume, stroke volume, heart rate, and cardiac output. Um, again, mirroring just the changes that occur during pregnancy, so they're exaggerated. Pulmonary hypertension exists, and it's proportional to the degree uh, of increase in plasma volume and stroke volume. It also can occur because these patients might be at risk for sleep apnea. Obese patients have impaired afterload reduction and high rates of hypertension, so increases in chamber size, and then they're at increased risk of coexisting cardiovascular disease and death from cardiovascular causes and peripartum cardiomyopathy, so some of what we just heard about. Obese patients have increased risks of the hypertensive diseases of pregnancy. Um, here on this chart, you just see the odds ratio by BMI classification of having a hypertensive disease of pregnancy compared to uh, normal BMI patients. Interestingly, patients who are both obese and have a hypertensive disease of pregnancy 
are at risk of long-term early cardiac death, and long-term was defined in the study as 15 years out from pregnancy. What you see on the left there is that as BMI increases, um, the risk of a hypertensive disease increases, and that's not that surprising. And on the right, you see that as BMI increases, mortality from cardiovascular causes at 15 years increases. And again, that's not that surprising. We know these patients are at risk. But when you delve into this data a little bit more, you uh, discover that it's actually the combination. In other words, the underweight and normal weight patients who had hypertensive diseases didn't necessarily have an increased risk. They're on the left. The patients, um, let's see, do I have a, hmm, is this it? Yes, this is it. The patients who um, were overweight or obese, though, and, and had a hypertensive disease of pregnancy, those were the ones that were specifically at risk of um, an early cardiac death. And the thinking is that we know obesity increases risk of death, but certainly not all obese patients suffer an early cardiac death. That maybe if you think of pregnancy as a stress test of sorts, that the um, physiologic and metabolic demands of pregnancy is not well tolerated in certain obese patients, and that that's a marker for uh, an early cardiac death. Um, regarding the uh, endocrine system, it's not surprising these patients are at increased risk of diabetes and glucose intolerance with all of the concomitant maternal and fetal, fetal complications you see listed. These authors tried to identify a certain uh, glucose level on an oral glucose tolerance test that would act as um, a marker for increased risk, and they were not able to identify a certain level. In other words, what they demonstrated was that as glucose increased from A, B, C, D, these are just increasing glucose levels, as it increased gradually, so did the risk of various complications of pregnancy. So even low levels of uh, glucose intolerance confer risk. Um, regarding the vascular system, we all know these patients are at increased thromboembolic risk, and this has been demonstrated specifically in the peripartum and perioperative periods. A lot of our patients are going to be on antithrombolytic drugs, making our job a little bit harder sometimes. Just to go through these um, as a practice advisory on this, um, most of our patients are going to be on the higher doses of these drugs, pregnant or obese patients. So in general, if they're on unfractionated heparin, it's probably going to be more than 5,000 uh, units BID. Um, and if they're on enoxaparin or deltaparin, they're going to be on the higher doses. You're going to have to wait 24 hours before you can give them a neuraxial anesthetic. Um, this is a slide we just saw. Basically, as Elliot said, we're seeing a decreased proportion of maternal deaths due to these so-called traditional causes like hemorrhage and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, and an increase in the proportion of deaths due to these um, coexisting conditions. And I think in part that may just be because our patients are, as we saw, older and more obese and therefore sicker. And then I can't show this slide without pointing out how low the rate of anesthetic-related deaths is and, um, you know, the fact that it continues to decline. Um, what about some obstetric and neonatal outcomes? Um, basically, obese patients just have a longer and harder labor. You see as the um, uh, BMI increases from here to here. That's what the colors are. The patients just tend to have a longer, harder labor. They also have a higher incidence of cesarean delivery. These are the lines for nulliparous and multiparous patients. You see if BMI increases, they're more likely to deliver by cesarean. These are patients I, um, attempting a trial of labor after cesarean, so as BMI increases, they're less likely to have a successful trial of labor in that clinical setting. 
Obese patients are more likely to undergo induction, instrumental delivery, cesarean delivery, emergency cesarean delivery, and have higher rates of hemorrhage. They're also more likely to have fetal and neonatal death. We know that from this large uh, study of over 50,000 patients. This is uh, neonatal death rate per, it's not working. This is neonatal death rate here um, per gestational age. The black triangles are the obese patients. So you see that rate is higher. And then this is the same data expressed as a hazard ratio. And again, the black trials are the obese patients. Um, so what are the implications for labor analgesia? I refer you to this really nice um, focused review by Olivia Linus that was published a couple years ago in Anesthesia and Analgesia for um, just kind of a nice overall on the topic. Although there are no randomized controlled trials, it is felt by most experts that in our very obese parturients, we should probably be encouraging early neuraxial labor analgesia. We know these patients are at risk for long dysfunctional labors, increased risk for cesarean and particularly emergency cesarean deliveries. And so the presence of an epidural catheter may help us avoid general anesthesia and airway manipulation in this high-risk population. And all of this may help us avoid systemic opioids in a population that may be at increased risk for sleep apnea. Um, unfortunately, it might be easier said than done because these patients are more likely to suffer a failure to establish blockade a subsequent failure, meaning a catheter that appears to be functioning may be more likely to have to be replaced at a later time, or a failure to extend at the time of cesarean delivery. Now these are interesting couple of papers. The paper on the top was published in some 20 odd years ago, and then the paper on the bottom was published just a year or two ago uh, by our colleagues at Wake Forest. And so they were able to compare the outcomes. Uh, they followed the, they followed the um, methods similarly, and they were able to compare outcomes from one time period to the next. And they were able to demonstrate that between these two time periods, they had fewer catheter replacements in their obese patients. So they were still replacing 17%, but much lower than the 42% from a few decades earlier and that they were able to do fewer general anesthetics for cesarean delivery. And in fact, the percentage of cesareans done under general was no different for their obese versus their non-obese uh, population in this second study, in the second time period. So we've gotten better at this, or at least Robert D'Angelo's group down at Wake Forest has gotten better at this. Um, so, what uh, has changed? Well, there's a few things. First of all, we know that there's increased depth to the epidural space. That's kind of obvious. Um, but we've discovered that that can be partially mitigated by the sitting position. If the patient's in the sitting position, the soft tissues fall in such a way that it's a shorter distance to the epidural space. And we also know, and I think Scott alluded to this on the panel yesterday, that the catheter may move relative to the skin. I guess maybe a better way to say it is the skin may move relative to the catheter with a change in position. And so in obese patients here on the right, when the patient changes from the flex to the sitting up position and then goes from up to lateral, or really from the flex sitting position to lateral, that catheter may move by a centimeter or more. I guess I should say the soft tissues may move by about a centimeter or more. So it's always a good thing to position your catheter where you want it, then let the patient move, then tape it in wherever it is. It hasn't really migrated in. It's just the soft tissues moving around it. I think ultrasound can make us better at this. Ultrasound can be used to estimate the vertebral level, as we see here, and to help us identify the midline and help us estimate the distance to the epidural space. Of course, the pictures don't look quite as pretty in the obese parturient, but I think for sure you can at least 
So even if you can't always see your sacrum, you can at least see where the spinous processes are on uh, um, when you do the longitudinal view. And then even if you don't see that beautiful picture of your double lines, I think you can always identify midline. At the very least, you can always see where it looks symmetric. And if it looks symmetric, then that's probably midline. Um, let's talk about um, spinal and epidural uh, level and sensitivity to local anesthetics in obesity. Obesity increases sensitivity to local anesthetics. Um, most people assume that it's kind of a pressure volume effect, and I'll show you some data on that. But what you see here is that as body mass increases, I'm sorry, BMI increases, that the level from a certain spinal drug increases. But what you'll notice is that there's a lot of scatter too. In other words, it's a little bit unpredictable. Similarly, when you compare a certain level in obese versus non-obese patients, you can see the level's a little bit higher in obese patients, but again, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of scatter, so it's a little bit unpredictable. Um, this is a similar study, but instead of going by BMI, these authors um, on the x-axis put abdominal circumference, and again, demonstrated increasing level with the same dose of drug, but you'll notice a little bit of scatter. And this is a similar study, but this is epidural um, labor analgesia, measuring an ED50 by up-down sequential allocation. You've probably seen this. The bottom, the bottom line here is that obese patients require less local anesthetic for the same effect compared to non-obese patients. The spread of block is related to lumbosacral fluid volume. We know that. This um, uh, study by Sullivan and colleagues demonstrates that obesity is associated with decreases in lumbosacral fluid volume. And so that's probably why you see increased sensitivity. But again, notice how much scatter you have here. And in all of these studies, the body mass index usually only goes up to about 40. And you can see even in this study, there was only one patient that had a BMI higher than 40. So when you have patients who have these very high BMIs of 50s, 60s, 70s, my personal um, record is 83, what kind of response are these patients going to have to local anesthetics? My answer is I have no idea. And so you have to be extremely cautious with these patients. I think it's very foolhardy to do a one-shot spinal on any of these extremely obese patients. I think you have to use some sort of titratable anesthetic. Um, on your very obese, and, and you know, how do we define that? I start to think about treating patients differently when they get to a BMI of 50. By the time there's a BMI over 60, I strongly consider the use of a continuous intrathecal catheter. Again, there are no randomized data, but I think most of us feel that there's good confirmation of placement a little bit more ease of titration compared to an epidural just because it's a faster onset and that it may be less likely to fail. But I remind you, there aren't really data showing us this. The obese patient population may be at decreased risk of postural puncture headache. Um, but the data are a little confounded because they're also at increased risk of C-section and we know that patients who deliver by cesarean have a lower risk of headache than those that deliver by uh, vaginally. So that's why I have that question mark there. We're not really sure if obesity protects against headache or not. Um, just, this is my recipe. This is not based on uh, any data at all, but the uh, uh, load, I do the load similar to the way I would do any other combined spinal epidural labor analgesic. For maintenance, I try and do everything through a continuous infusion so I don't have to break the system because I don't want to increase the risk of infection. You are crossing the blood-brain barrier. Even though the risk of infection is very low, it's probably increased compared to an epidural catheter. So I do everything with the same solution I use for labor analgesia, which as you see here is a 16th percent bupivacaine solution. 
I start at two cc's per hour. If the patient needs a redose, I give my bolus, again, through the infusion of two cc's, and then I increase to two cc's. I've never had to go to a higher than six cc's per hour for labor analgesia. Um, I just want to leave you by uh, citing this article by our colleague, Jill Meyer. Um, she demonstrated that obesity was a large factor in anesthesia-related maternal deaths in the state of Michigan, and that what was interesting from this article was that a lot of the airway deaths that occur in the obese are no longer occurring during induction. I think we've learned a lot about induction, but a lot of our airway deaths in obese partrians are occurring either during emergence or in the immediate recovery period. And so we really need to keep a close eye on these patients during those periods. Um, I know you can't read every line of this. My point in putting this up here is this is our protocol for how we deal with severely obese patients where I work, which is the University of Chicago. So there's a the top thing here is communication, and then it's by nursing, obstetrics, and anesthesia, and it tells each service what they're expected to do, and it's separated. If someone's coming in for a vaginal delivery, what do we all have to do? If somebody's having a cesarean delivery, what does each service have to do? And in the post-operative period, what do we all have to do? Okay, and so I think the only way you can take care of these really extremely obese patients safely is with really close multidisciplinary collaboration. All right, so our conclusions are that the physiologic effects of obesity get superimposed on those of pregnancy, exaggerating those effects. They're at risk for adverse obstetric outcomes, and don't forget, including cesarean delivery and especially emergency cesarean delivery, they're also at increased risk for adverse fetal and neonatal outcomes and anesthetic outcomes, and so multidisciplinary planning and teamwork is essential. Thank you. Uh -huh.